friends, it's a privilege for me that I've been asked to be part of this panel. You have already heard two presentations, one by Prabir and one by Ajaz. I'd just like to build upon them. I think it is ironical that in the tragedy of the collapse of the Soviet Union, you actually had a confirmation of many of Marx's insights. At least three examples I can give. The first is that, you know, an essential component of philosophical materialism is the proposition that the, between the intentions with which people move to make political changes and the outcome of those political changes, there is no coincidence. If the intentions behind political movements and the outcome of political movements actually coincided, in that case, philosophical materialism would cease to be relevant. Remarkably, in the Soviet Union, when we had the collapse of the Soviet Union, that collapse was brought about and generated a lot of hopes, hopes of democracy, hopes of um, an improvement in the conditions of life, because for some time in the Soviet Union there had been a certain degree of economic stagnation and so on. But what you had was just the opposite. You had a situation where for the first time in non-war conditions, there was a reduction in life expectancy. You had a situation where there was a dramatic collapse in the conditions of life, including in the nutritional levels of the population. You had the taking over by the mafia of the political scene, which was supposed to have moved towards democracy. As a result, what you had was a remarkable hiatus between the intentions with which the people had moved when the Soviet Union collapsed and the actual outcome of it. And that, in a very peculiar, ironical sense, amount to a vindication of Marx's materialism. The second example I'd like to give of how ironically the collapse of the Soviet Union vindicated uh, uh, a Marxist position is the following. Once an anti-communist friend of mine told me the following. He said that, listen, every revolution even though it does not achieve what it sets out to do, nonetheless represents social progress. Look at the French Revolution. Yes, of course, the French Revolution, liberty, equality, fraternity, you didn't actually have liberty, equality, fraternity, but nonetheless there was an improvement compared to the pre-revolutionary situation. The Bolshevik Revolution, in fact, was one which had set before the people a certain set of objectives. But now you have the collapse of the Soviet Union, Union, and with that collapse, you're not actually moving towards any greater social progress compared to what capitalism has achieved. Therefore, in a certain sense, his argument was that really the residue of the Bolshevik Revolution is a non-existent. Now, in a peculiar sense, that's a confirmation, in my view, of a Marxist proposition that really between capitalism and socialism, there is no half halfway house. That, you know, had there been a halfway house, then the collapse of the Soviet Union would actually have meant the stabilization of society with a mode of production that's not exactly capitalist, but somewhere halfway between the two. In my youth, we used to have innumerable debates about, you know, with this, you know, I mean, anti-left people used to talk about Soviet Union being state capitalist, the Soviet Union being all kinds of things, convergence thesis and so on. And we spent a lot of, I mean, I certainly spent a lot of my youth arguing those debates. And now it turns out that as a matter of fact, history has confirmed how irrelevant those debates were. There may be many things wrong with the Soviet Union as it then existed, but nonetheless, the socialism that existed in the Soviet Union was not acceptable to capitalism. There was no halfway house where the Soviet Union could be stabilized. No convergence, no state capitalism, and, and, and so on. The third thing which, which, which both Ajaz and Prabir have referred to is, in a certain sense, a very vindication of the category of imperialism. 
that all this time we were told that, okay, I mean, you know, NATO is a defensive organization and all these various military blocks which were set up by the United States were there in order to counter the communist threat, the domino theory and all the rest of it. But as a matter of fact, the Soviet Union has gone. Communist threat has receded, but nonetheless, these organizations exist. And as Aja said, they are now carrying on several wars all over the globe. The reality of imperialism, the category of imperialism is, as it were, primary. In other words, it, it, it exists. Socialism was a challenge to it, and even when that challenge is withdrawn or has receded, the reality of imperialism has not receded. But where does the collapse of the Soviet Union actually leave us at this conjuncture? I think there is a, there is a tendency in Marxism which is, which is uh, I mean, the, 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 the arch representative of that tendency within Marxism is probably Georgi Plekhanov, which sees socialism as being an inevitable outcome of historical progress, of, 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 of historical development. I wish that was the case, but I do not actually share that view. I think the struggle for socialism is something which requires a massive intervention of the praxis of the proletariat. The struggle for socialism implies a qualitative shift from being trapped within history to transcending history. And that qualitative shift is something which is not inevitable. It really requires an enormous application for the just said will. It requires an enormous application and understanding of theory. And of course, it is something which has many pitfalls. Being an optimist, I certainly believe that mankind would eventually make a transition to socialism, not because it's in some sense inevitable, but because of the fact that I, I, I believe, I mean, I have great faith in sort of, you know, uh, human intelligence and praxis. Lukács once said that it took 300 years to make the transition from feudalism to capitalism. We should probably now reconcile ourselves with the fact that uh, it would take a fairly long time to have a transition from capitalism to socialism. But the fact remains that to the extent that it's a transition which requires conscious interventions, it's not something which would automatically arise because of some laws of history, there would be pitfalls. The collapse of the Soviet Union is representative of such pitfalls. Now, I think the basically the way I'd like to see it is that there are, as it were, revolutionary waves. There are situation conjunctures which are favorable to revolutionary upsurges. I think the period from around 1914 till about 1950 was a period which really represented such a conjuncture. When, when capitalism was in dire straits, when capitalism did not, uh, you know, I mean, find a way out of the predicament in which it was trapped. A fact that Lenin himself used in the second in his speech to the Second Congress of the Comintern. The fact that capitalism was trapped in a predicament from which it could not find a way out, and therefore the future of mankind could only be ensured through a transcendence of capitalism. That phase is something which, which was a phase of revolutionary upsurge, and that phase, roughly speaking, was from the period 1914 till about 1950, though of course subsequently, as it were, the residue of that phase in terms of the liberation of Vietnam or the residue of that phase in terms of third world liberation is something that continued afterwards. But roughly speaking, you had this massive upsurge. I think the period since then, even though, as I said, it witnessed the continuation of certain residual aspects of that phase is something which nonetheless represented a period of stasis. Now, one of the problems which arises, which is why, as I said, getting out of the trap of history is not very easy. One of the problems that arises is what happens to countries which have actually transcended capitalism in a certain revolutionary phase, but the world as a whole has not. 
And that was the predicament of the Soviet Union. That, 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 that you have, I mean, that was a predicament not only of the Soviet Union, that was a predicament with which the communist movement of the world, and certainly Lenin, and certainly the Bolshevik Party, actually uh, struggled all the time. I mean, even Lenin's last few writings, in which, having given up hopes of the German Revolution, he talks about the fact that China and India are countries on which revolution is in the horizon, and Russia, China, India together would represent a very substantial chunk of humanity. What happens to revolutions? What happens to revolutions that may succeed within a certain phase, but on the other hand, in the period of stasis, how do they cope with the essential aggressive attacks of imperialism against them? Now, to my mind, one of the lessons of the Soviet Union is this, that, you know, that, that there is a view the, or, or, you know, I mean, there is a tendency, uh, or almost uh, uh, a kind of, you know, a tendency is very powerful. If you are caught in a peri period in which the revolutionary wave is subsiding, you are under attack, then of course it's essential to hold on to the gains of the revolution. To hold on to the gains of the revolution, you have to arm yourself, you have to develop the economy, you have to develop yourselves materially in order to cope with the situation. And this material development is something which may well be characterized by the imposition of a degree of discipline on society in which the possibility of any kind of counter-revolutionary uh, uh, uprisings are crushed. In other words, the combination of a closure of the political arena together with an emphasis on material developments of production and therefore armaments and so on is something which is, uh, appears as the way out. I think the collapse of the Soviet Union, in a sense, implies that we have to rethink that. That we have to rethink whether, as it were, the closure of political activity, and really one of the real things about the cost which the Soviet Union had to pay for coping with counter-revolution in the way it did was the depoliticization of the working class. And the idea, therefore, is that in a certain sense, simply being armed, simply being able to, I mean, you have to have, you have to be armed, I'm, I'm, I'm not questioning that, but simply developing your armed might, simply developing your economy in a situation where, if you like, the political uh, uh, activism of the basic classes is necessarily suppressed because of the contingencies of that historical conjuncture is not enough of a protection against the onslaught of capitalism and imperialism. In other words, I think the idea that in a certain sense a dictatorship of the party backed up by a rapid rate of growth and of course uh, 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 a fairly strong development of the armed strength of the state is enough to cope with imperialism. That proposition is something which has been invalidated in my view by the collapse of the Soviet Union. In other words, it would be essential that in any such period, the idea of preventing the depoliticization of the basic classes, ensuring that their political life remains active, is something which becomes an absolutely essential condition for the survival of socialism, even in this period of stasis. I say this because at this moment, it seems to me, notwithstanding all the cautions that Ajaz has, as it were, underlined, and with which all I, 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 I agree that we are now witnessing the development of a new revolutionary wave. To say this is not to apotheosize all the demonstrations and so on that they are taking place, which of course have their limitations, but again we are entering a period in which I think the capacity of capitalism to 
find a way out of the crisis in which it's currently enmeshed appears to me extremely limited. This crisis is not just a financial crisis or the recession and so on. I mean, I think, I think in a certain sense, if you look at the world today, there's not one, but there are at least two quite different and equally serious crises. One of which is an acute food crisis, which is affecting the entire world. You have had since the 1980s a fairly significant noticeable decline in per capita food output, per capita food availability, per capita food grain availability, per capita cereal availability, whatever is, is the way that you wish to measure it as far as the world's population is concerned. Therefore, hunger, malnutrition, etc. are really on the increase. And this is not something which is arising because of some peculiar happenstances. This is it's not a Ricardian problem. But I think it's happening precisely because of the characteristics of contemporary capitalism. I think contemporary capitalism, as you know, is, is characterized by the hegemony of international finance capital. In this period of hegemony of international finance capital, a process of primitive accumulation of capital is unleashed on vast segments of the peasantry and the um, petty producers, small producers, and so on, pre-capitalist producers, non-capitalist producers, many of whom are located in the third world countries. If you unleash on them a process of primitive accumulation of capital, on the other hand, their absorption into the active army of labor under capitalism does not exist, or as Eja said, jobless growth and so on. In that case, inevitably, Capitalist development in the world as a whole is accompanied by a process of absolute impoverishment. The more capitalism develops, the greater is the process of absolute impoverishment. This whole idea that somehow there would be what's it called um, uh, trickle down or you know and, and so on is complete uh, you know I mean, this is completely wrong. In, in 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 fact, you find that precisely in the in in the period in which you have had in countries like India high rates of growth are the period, is, is the period in which there has been a very strong process of absolute impoverishment. And this is not just true of India. I think this is true of the world as a whole. The fact of capitalist growth on the one hand is something which is really accompanied by a process of primitive accumulation and absolute impoverishment. The second crisis which, which everybody talks about is again related to the hegemony of finance, to the emergence of international finance capital. Capital, and that is to do with the fact, as we know, that in capitalism now, we are in the midst of a recession from which there is no easy way out. Let me just devote one or two uh, 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 you know, minutes to this. In periods, I mean, you know, capitalism has passed historically through a number of different phases. In the first phase, the entire dynamism of 19th century capitalism right up to the First World War, the dynamism of Victorian and Edwardian capitalism was sustained by the, by the colonial system. You had the colonial economies from which there was drain taking place, which also provided markets for goods from the capitalist countries. And of course, much of this drain was invested in the temperate regions of white settlement, United States, Canada, and so on and so forth. So capitalism really had a fairly kind of, you know, long boom, which underlying which was the colonial system. In a certain sense, with the First World War, the limits of that arrangement were reached. That is why the period of the interwar years in which you did you you had the old system having reached its limits, capitalism not able to find a new prop for its development, was a period of depression, was a period of the Great Depression, and so on and so forth. In the post-Second World War period, you once more had a situation where there was state intervention in demand management. The state played a major role. The capitalist state came into its own to ensure that the system developed and that was a period which was called by many the golden age of capitalism. I think what has happened now is that the hegemony of finance implies that in a sense the state instead of being outside of the system is itself hegemonized by finance. When you find 
an organization like Standard & Poor's saying that the U.S. state, which is the mightiest capitalist state in the world, is not creditworthy. You just begin to wonder, who are these pipsqueaks to actually say the U.S. state is not creditworthy? They say it because behind them, of course, is the confidence of finance. Now, likewise, you find, you look at Greece, you look at any of these countries, the Greece gov Greek government's debt is not creditworthy. Why? The Greek government has to go to the market in order to be able to float its debt. That was not the case earlier. That's a feature of neoliberalism and that's something which is a hallmark of hegemony of finance capital. As you know, the neoliberal policies themselves reflect the hegemony of finance capital. In India, for instance, during the period that Nehru and Indira Gandhi and so on were prime ministers, the state told the central bank of the country that, look, this is the amount we which we are going to borrow from you. And the central bank jolly well had to cough up that money uh, directly or as the underwriter of the state. And of course, your statutory liquidity ratios and so on. Banks had to give loans to the state statutorily. One of the first things that neoliberalism in India did is to say that the amount of government borrowing from the Reserve Bank of India is limited. The government cannot borrow beyond a certain amount. If so, then the government goes to the market. If it goes to the market, then it has to kowtow to the whims and caprices of the financiers in order to be able to borrow. And therefore, in a sense, what you now have, unlike what Keynes had visualized, you now have a situation where the state, instead of being, as it were, an extrinsic entity to the system, which then rationally intervenes to make the system, as it were, you know, manageable, the state itself becomes part of the immanence of the system. And if that is the case, in the capacity of the state to stabilize it is something which is greatly impaired. Therefore, you, we, we are now in a period in which capitalism is without any external props of any kind. Colonialism is no longer something. I mean, you know, I, I know that they would try and get oil and, and, and all the rest of it, but in fact, the capacity of capitalism's using colonialism to stabilize itself to a new golden age is something which is non-existent. The same is true as far as the state is concerned. That being the case, you would have prolonged crisis in which there may be an occasional relief in the form of a new bubble of some kind, but ultimately as the bubble collapses, you'd be in a, in, in, in a crisis again. So as far as the advanced countries are concerned, they would be trapped in that kind of a crisis. As far as the backward countries, the underdeveloped countries are concerned, they are trapped in an acute process of, I mean, much of their population, not the billionaires who are coming up, much of their population is trapped in an acute process of absolute impoverishment. And I see no way within the parameters of hegemony of finance capital, as long as that is not overcome, I see no way that capitalism can find a solution to the crisis in which it is itself caught. Therefore, in a very objective sense, the kind of situation that capitalism confronts today is comparable to the earlier wave between 1914 and 1950 that I was talking about. And that being the case, even though we may be skeptical, as Ajaz rightly says, about the specific kind of movements that may be happening around the world, but nonetheless, I think in a very deep sense, the possibility of a revolutionary overcoming of capitalism really comes on the historical agenda. But of course, you see, each wave must have its own forms of struggle, it must have its own agendas, it must have its own kind of scenario, as it were, within which the process of transcendence of capitalism can take place inside that particular wave. Now, I think certainly in countries like ours, as this new wave develops all over the world, there are at least three issues which I think are going to become very important. In order to introduce this, these issues, I must tell you a story. You see that Julius Martov, who was the Menshevik leader uh, with whom Lenin uh, had very great personal kind of you know friendship and so on, Julius Martov once raised the question that, look, you talk about proletariat, but the point is that, you know, if you capture power, 
then you cannot simply push a proletarian agenda. You have to push an agenda which is as it were, much broader than the proletarian agenda. It has to be an agenda for the people as a whole. To which Lenin's answer was that, yes, I, I, I agree with you, but it's an agenda which would include the peasantry, it, it, it'll include large segments of the population, that the dictatorship of the proletariat does not just mean that it's only for the proletariat that we are working, but we're actually working on an agenda that would benefit large segments of the population. Now, I think in that sense, when we are talking about a new revolutionary wave emerging, I think we have to think in terms of ways in which the left can actually devise an agenda for large seg segments of the population. And I think this, this agenda must have at least three very important components in countries like ours. One component, Ajaz has already referred to it, is the fact that the proletariat or the left or the, or, or the working class political formations must play the role of defending the small producers, the petty producers, the peasantry, and so on, all of whom are being attacked by the hegemony of international finance capital. So, so, so they must, in a sense, defend the people at large. They must emerge as the champions of the people at large. Therefore, it's not just only workers and peasants alliance in some narrow sense, but the working class must emerge as the champion of the interests of vast masses of small and petty producers, which, of course, entails its own challenge because after all the left is not interested in only remaining confined to some kind of a petty bourgeois society. How to defend their interests and yet take society forward is challenging, but nonetheless it is something which has to be done. The second is obvious that, you know, uh, imperialism. Anti-imperialism is absolutely essential. Anti-imperialism not, is not only anti-Americanism because we live in a world in which large segments of our own big bourgeoisie is now very closely integrated with international finance capital and is very closely integrated also therefore with the corporate the, 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 the big corporate bourgeoisie of the world that's a pretty obvious thing the left has to play the role of leading an attack on them and the third thing in certainly in societies like ours is that the left has to stand for modernity now modernity is a very difficult concept and so on but to me the essence of modernity in societies like ours, which have had this long history of caste oppression and so on, is equality. And I think one of the ways equality rep, you know, expresses itself in our societies is through political democracy. Now, I know it's, our political democracy may be flawed. I know most of them are millionaires. Most of a large chunk of them may be crooks and so on. But nonetheless, we have to distinguish between democracy as a form of governance in which, of course, there are all kinds of limitations, but democracy also as a way of organizing the polity. And I think organizing the polity on the basis of a formal juridical equality among everybody is something which is a major development. You know, I keep saying this because, because I actually come from a village in Orissa, and I have seen with my own eyes the kind of anger that in 1952, when the first general elections were held, that the upper caste had at the idea that that Dalit has an equal vote as me. How ridiculous. You know, I mean, I think really, given the state of our, the millennia of our caste oppression, it's a major advance, and I think the left must carry that advance forward, socially, politically, by defending democracy, unlike, you know, I mean, in other words, I keep joking that if we actually had a one-party dictatorship, then that would be a Brahmin dictatorship in our country, and that, that's no good. Even if it's a one-party communist dictatorship, that will still be a Brahmin dictatorship, and we have to avoid that. Therefore, I think, in some ways, we really have to uh, understand the current conjuncture and for that and, and, and carry and and, and and, and realize its historic potentials, and for that is very essential to have a theoretical grasp. The last point I want to make, I mean, I, I feel very sorry that, you know, among many of my students, you know, brilliant students, very, very motivated students, you know, they are much more concerned with doing good things. You know, they'd like to go and help some poor family, 
they would like to go and organize, let's say, uh, uh, the laborers on our campus, which of course very good, but you know, say, do, do something good to them. But on the other hand, the taste for theory is much less, and that is something which worries me. I think it's very important, if we're going to carry the Lyft project forward, that the taste for theory must be revived, because Marxism is essentially, first and foremost, it's a struggle at the realm of theory. Thank you.